Deputies, the Leader of the Opposition. You're probably looking at the order of crimes. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Enclosed Lands Crimes and Law Enforcement Legislation Amendment Interference Bill 2016. Um, the Opposition resolutely opposes uh, the Bill and the measures contained within it. Uh, on the one hand, uh, Mr. President, uh, the Bill is completely unnecessary. Um, if the government has concerns uh, about issues such as uh, trespass, obstruction, uh, criminal damage, as it claims, there are a panoply of existing laws in the Crimes Act and elsewhere that comprehensively deals uh, with these matters. Um, if, for example, uh, the government is concerned about uh, CSG and mining operations, there are, of course, very specific provisions uh, in the petroleum onshore legislation, for example, section 125 capital C, the obstruction of the holder of a petroleum title, and there's also a range of offences uh, in the Mining Act, uh, such as 257, obstruction uh, of a person uh, restricting or obstructing uh, things on a mine and uh, 378B, obstruction of the holder of a mining authorisation, uh, which actually contain penalties uh, which are higher than those contained in this legislation. However, that's not the real purpose uh, of this bill. Uh, the real, well, I acknowledge that interjection. The purpose of this bill is to try and threaten and intimidate citizens of this state from engaging in peaceful and lawful protest uh, as they have been able to do so uh, for generations. And uh, in so doing, the bill contains a range of provisions uh, which are aimed at elevating the rights of coal seam gas and mining companies above that of other private property owners. And then, in what can only be described as a series of fairly extraordinary measures, contains powers of police uh, search and seizure, indeed confiscation of property, uh, without uh, protection uh, at law, without recourse to the courts uh, of private property. Uh, so for a, for a party that claims to respect uh, private property rights, uh, these measures are quite uh, breathtaking. Uh, in, addition, in addition, the legislation uh, contains measures uh, to enable police to effectively shut down peaceful protests, not only on enclosed lands or adjacent to enclosed lands, not only in relation to mining or coal seam gas, but across the board, because these uh, amendments uh, are to uh, the law enforcement powers and responsibilities legislation, which applies uh, generally uh, to peaceful protests. Uh, and so the like. Anyway, these uh, the fact is, is uh, these measures are insidious, they are anti-democratic, and they create a narrative which is uh, attempting to stifle public discussion and dissent. Uh, in particular, uh, this law is aimed specifically at non-violent protests. Uh, Australia, indeed this state, uh, Mr Deputy President, uh, Mr. Uh, has a long history of non-violent protest uh, and has been a significant world leader in promoting and affecting social change through community movements engaged in, engaged in campaigning and indeed in protests. Uh, violence has not generally been a feature of these movements and therefore it raises the question about why the government feels that it needs uh, this law. And what's really interesting is if you look at the Minister's press release on, the, on Monday the 7th of March, there is only, apart from a, a summary of the legislation, there is only a bland claim that the bill uh, will ensure the right to peaceful protest is balanced with the need to ensure public safety, the safety of workers, the protection of communities and lawful business activity. Uh, but on the radio the Minister was talking about things uh, for which the bill was required. Uh, and I believe he referred to things like the cutting of power lines oh. and, the, and the tampering uh, with explosives. Now, those matters, if ever established in fact, are already serious criminal offences. They're not addressed by this bill. They're addressed elsewhere in the law. 
So this bill, in, in one sense, rests on a complete fraud by the government. But as I say, there are a series of provisions in it which are insidious, are anti-democratic and should be opposed root and branch. All of the activities that could disrupt business activities covered by these new anti-protest laws, if they're passed, are already covered by existing minor public order offences, such as obstruction and trespass, or, as I mentioned earlier, specific provisions of mining and gas legislation. Uh, these laws, taken together, represent, I believe, a significant attack on our collective freedoms, and um, uh, they should be utterly uh, rejected. Now, Schedule 1 uh, uh, deals with an amendment of the Enclosed Lands Protection Act, 1901, and uh, creates an aggravated unlawful entry uh, on enclosed lands. It provides for a tenfold increase in the maximum penalty, which exists now for trespass in the Crimes Act. But proposed section 4, capital B, will apply uh, not only to mining or petroleum operations, but to any site upon which any business or undertaking is conducted. And therefore, it will penalise any person who interferes with or attempts to or intends to interfere with the conduct of a business or an undertaking. This provision, if enacted, would elevate business activity and business premises and undertakings above other private property rights by providing for a higher penalty for that offence. So if you're, you're interfering with someone's property rights, there will be a, a $500 fine maximum. But if you're interfering with business activities, it'll be a five and a half thousand dollar fine. Um, so what we see from those opposite, uh, Mr. Deputy President, is the party of big business talking, because this provision, if enacted, would elevate the rights of business over any other property owner. Nothing could speak uh, more clearly to that than this uh, provision. And the idea of business rights taking precedence over civil or political rights or even other private property rights is a new and retrograde development in our democracy and should be rejected by this House and by this Parliament. This law... Um, the next provision is found uh, in Schedule 2, which amends the Crimes Act 1900, and adds petroleum gas operations within the definition of a mine for the purposes of the offence in Section 201 of the Crimes Act of interfering with a mine. Um, now, um, now, this is an offence that carries a maximum penalty of imprisonment of up to seven years, uh, and as I indicated, um, uh, it would extend the definition of a mine so that it extends um, to equipment and other things associated with a mine and to a gas or other petroleum extraction site, a mineral or gas or other petroleum exploration site and a work construction site for proposed minerals or gas or other petroleum extraction and a former mine at which works are being carried out to decommission the mine or to make it safe. And this, uh, the effect of this is that protests at coal seam gas or other gas operations could now fall within the scope of this offence, which, as I indicated earlier, carries a maximum penalty of up to seven years. The amendments would mean that not only are the activities of people protesting, for example, at Bentley or at the Pilliga, but also landholders who oppose coal seam gas drilling rigs from coming onto their properties could in future be charged with interfering with <coughs> a mine under Section 201 of the Crimes Act. Now, it is the case that landholders in New South Wales have no legal right to prevent minerals exploration or extraction on their property. Do you Dave. understand that? Uh, the Labor Party accepts this as a cornerstone of uh, the state's approach to resources development generally. However, if a petroleum pro uh, production project is approved over a farmer's property uh, and that farmer or his family or friends take action to block access on their own property. On their own property, if this becomes law, they will be able to be charged with interfering with a mine. Landholders could therefore be arrested on their own property for hindering the working of CSG equipment that is being driven onto their property by these extraction companies. Um, now, this extraordinary legal power is completely at odds with the principles of land access signed by Santos and the New South Wales Farmers Association and would, if enacted, uh, hand 
to coal sand gas and other mining companies de facto ownership of farming land in this state uh, with rights in excess of those enjoyed by the actual land holder. Now, for a minister and for a political party that claims to respect and to be founded on the protection of private property rights, this is extraordinary legislation, and I'm referring to the Liberal Party when I say that. But turning to the National Party, for a party that claims to represent farming communities and rural and regional New South Wales, where so many of these contested uh, matters have been occurring, this is completely derelict in their duty to respect and to speak up for their communities. Because, as I indicated, the, the effect of this uh, expansion of the definition of a mine will be to criminalise the peaceful protests that have been occurring in connection with CSG across this state, to criminalise the right to protest enjoyed by regular citizens, rights which they have enjoyed for generations, rights which we must protect and hand down to generations to come. Um, it's simply, uh, it would simply be an outrage if these provisions were enacted and we were to say to farmers, if you protest on your own property, you can be made a criminal, you can be charged with this offence. Um, that is not the way to deal with these often divisive uh, community discussions about resources and about the coal sand gas industry. There are other better ways and we must find them together, not to enact provisions which divide our communities, which criminalise regular people seeking to stand up for their land, to stand up for their communities. Uh, this is not a case of saying, well, um, you know, that uh, farmers shouldn't be allowed to protest about other people's projects. Uh, this would affect farmers trying to protect their own land as well, and we simply should not uh, permit that right to protest, to resist, to, to say to whoever the government of the day, we disagree respectfully with what you're doing and we will protest about that. Criminalising and exposing to risk of serious jail time is not the appropriate or the right approach. It's, it's just completely outrageous. Uh, Schedule 3 amends the Law Enforcement Powers and Responsibilities Act and adds a new Division 7 at the end of Part 4 that provides for additional and, quite frankly, extraordinary search and seizure powers in relation to lock-on device, devices. The new proposed uh, Section 45 capital A applies to anything that is intended to be used to lock on or to secure a person to any plant equipment or structure. And the new Section 45 capital B provides a police officer with the power to stop, search and detain a person or vehicle on the grounds of a reasonable suspicion that a person has, the, has possession of a thing to which the division applies and for seizure of such items. And it enables the police to do that on the basis of suspicion or reasonable suspicion, not on the basis of any search warrant. Uh, the provision provides for a power to seize private property on the basis of suspected and prescribed future intended use. It would extend to common items such as bicycle locks, padlocks, chains, ropes, barrels and tins. And some of these could be common items in vehicles of farmers or tradesmen. It's possible that it could even extend to tractors or other agricultural machinery or trucks and the like if the police suspected that these were intended to be used as part of uh, a lock-on installation or otherwise proposed, proposed a threat to public safety. Um, so farmers taking farm equipment or their trucks uh, to protests uh, could find these, uh, and often these are very expensive articles of, uh, uh, of equipment, uh, often uh, tens of thousands of dollars worth, sometimes more, um, and, sometimes, and often subject to heavy and steep financing with high interest rates. Uh, farmers could, and, and could find these uh, possessions, these properties, uh, seized by police. And under this bill, under this bill, all of those things are forfeited to the Crown permanently. You don't get them back. If the reasonable suspicion of the police it's officer turns out... I don't know if you can. Oh, they're, they're auction. Well, uh, yes, it doesn't mean you can buy the, your thing back. <laughs> you know, I, I acknowledge that interjection. But what we have here is the confiscation of property and property rights without any due process. On the basis of the police officer's reasonable suspicion, they can take these things permanently. Because the legislation in 45 capital C <coughs> provides for that. 
can't get them back, you can't go to court, your rights to those properties are completely quashed. It's completely outrageous. Because what if the policeman made a mistake? I know it's an extraordinary proposition, but such things do happen from time to time. And you have a situation there for, uh, where people can lose property, very valuable property. Um, um, so we, we certainly oppose that aspect of the bill uh, vigorously. Uh, there is also uh, uh, provisions in the bill which seek to lift the limitation on the exercise of police powers under Section 200 of the Law Enforcement Powers and Responsibility Act 2002. The new Section 200 creates an exception to the existing limitation on the use of police move-on powers in relation to genuine protests by allowing the move-on orders to be issued to protesters where the gathering is obstructing traffic. Um, by granting police the power to give uh, directions to protesters unless they have authorisation under the Summary Offences Act, uh, the bill seeks to provide police effectively with the powers to veto any and all non-violent protests and assemblies through these direction powers. In so doing, this bill effectively equates non-violent protests in public places with the violent behaviour which is criminalised by Section 545 capital C of the Crimes Act. Um, now, existing laws in relation to obstruction already enable police to arrest any person who is obstructing traffic. One of the effects of this new law would be to extend criminal liability beyond any individual who is obstructing traffic to encompass all persons who are attending an assembly where the obstruction occurs. In this sense, the laws are aimed not just at the obstruction, if it occurs, but at the assembly that accompanies it, whether or not the persons who are issued with the move-on orders are in fact themselves obstructing the traffic. For this reason, it provides a very low threshold for the use of the powers and easily triggered an overly wide mechanism for the dispersal of any protest in New South Wales. And as I indicated, it's not limited to mining or CSG, but it could extend, for example, to protests about council amalgamations or any other government policy or program that the community legitimately takes issue with. The extension of the laws to control all attendees at a given event reveals the true character of these proposed laws as laws against protest and assembly generally rather than laws against a, a subset of obstruction or protest in relation to mining. Taken together, these laws, in my view, and the view of the Labor opposition, represent a very serious winding back of civil and political rights in New South Wales in relation to matters over which there has been no demonstrable failure of the existing laws whether it's relation to trespass, obstruction, criminal damage, the government has not made, has not even attempted to make the case that the existing laws are somehow deficient or weak. So the fact is, this bill and, what it, and, and the matters that it contains demonstrate an ideology, a view of the world, that the interests of business have priority over the interests of other property holders and citizens in this state and over basic civil and political rights in our democracy. In our democracy. Now, the bill has alarmed uh, many observers. Many observers. Order. Order. Kick him out. Honourable member will not cause disturbance in this chamber while a member is speaking. The member will be heard in silence. The Honourable Adam Searle. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. Um, the Law Society of New South Wales has provided to the government and to members of parliament uh, a reasonably brief summary not only of the contents of the bill uh, and its effects, and I will quote uh, briefly from uh, some of their submission because it's worth noting. Uh, the Law Society is concerned that the proposed new laws will interfere with the ability of people in New South Wales to engage in demonstrations, protests, processions or assemblies. And the Law Society considers uh, this right an important aspect of a democratic state. These amendments appear to again expand police powers without the safeguard of judicial oversight. They may also interfere with the right against arbitrary deprivation of property. Quote, unquote. 
Um, I quote further in the submission, um, quote, we consider that the New South Wales Police already have extraordinary powers of search and seizure and are able to restrain and detain people for their own or other safety. The proposed amendments do not appear to be either necessary or proportionate." Unquote. Um, the uh, Law Society also gives to, goes on to give uh, a very detailed uh, analysis of the bill and its provisions, which I won't repeat here. Uh, the New South Wales Bar Association, representing the barristers of New South Wales, also considers, and I quote, that the bill must not be enacted in its present form, unquote, because of the uh, shortcomings uh, that that organisation identifies. Um, in relation to the new aggravated offence of trespass uh, on enclosed lands where it would interfere with or attempt to interfere with the conduct of a business, uh, the Bar Association says, and I quote, the new offence is expressed in words that are very wide and uncertain in meaning. In particular, there is a wide range of potential conduct by which a person might be considered to act in a way that interferes with or attempts to interfere with the conduct of a business or undertaking when that person is on enclosed lands without consent. By way of an analogy, a decision in the Supreme Court of Western Australia in 2011 mm -hmm. held that an offence of interfering with fishing gear was committed if the fishing gear was, quote, handled, used in any way or in any way dealt with rather than being left alone. I thought it was maybe section 88. Interfe unquote. Interference with the conduct of a business or undertaking could likewise include any use or contact with the tangible Just property of the business as well as any disruption, apparently, yeah. however insubstantial it might be, to the processes and activities of the business. Uh, unquote. Uh, the Bar Association goes on to say, quote, further the broad meaning of the terms used in proposed section 4, capital B, does not appear to reflect the more limited purpose of the government as indicated in the second reading speech, comma, namely to protect against real threats to personal safety and severe disruption to lawful business activity, unquote. Uh, the Bar Association goes on to say, and I quote, there are existing laws presently available in respect of trespass unlawful assembly and criminal damage. If, despite the continuing availability of those laws, the creation of an additional offence is considered necessary, it should be restricted to instances of proven severe disruption or actual damage to business or undertaking or circumstances in which there is a serious and immediate risk of significant physical harm to a person, uh, unquote. Well, within the year. Um, uh, in relation to the proposed Sorry, powers uh, to, uh, without yeah, a warrant to stop, search and detain a person or a vehicle, if the police officer suspects Thanks. on reasonable grounds the person has or the vehicle contains anything to which the division applies, the Bar Association says that uh, proposed sections 45 capital A and 45 capital B, and I quote, provides an unclear but potentially very intrusive power of search and seizure without a warrant. For example, a person and their vehicle might be stopped, detained and searched because a police officer suspects that the vehicle contains rope or wire and a padlock that may be used in an unsafe way. The forfeiture of things seized under 45B also permits the local area commander of police to destroy or dispose of the thing. 45B4 provides that a court does not have jurisdiction to order delivery of the thing to a person for whom it was lawfully seized under Part 17, which otherwise provides for the recovery of property in police custody, including by way of application to a court. And the Bar Association goes on to say, and I quote, the proposed additional powers of search and seizure without warrant appear to be an excessive and disproportionate response to the perceived problem, quote, unquote. Um, in relation to the, uh, uh, the expansion of the move-on powers, uh, the new Section 200 of the Law Enforcement Powers and Responsibility Act, um, the Bar Association, after uh, analysing the provision proposed, uh, goes on to say, and I quote, uh, the bill sets the threshold too low for the activation of police powers in respect of a procession assembly or demonstration. Uh, and, uh, and further I quote, a direction should be able to be given by a police officer to an individual or group in a public assembly procession, demonstration or protest on safety grounds only in circumstances in which there is a serious and imminent risk of significant physical harm to a person, uh, quote unquote. Uh, the threshold for police action uh, in summary, according to the Bar Association, is uh, far too low. Um, and they go on to give uh, a, a, an extensive uh, re set of reasons for that. 
uh, including noting that there are an extensive range of community groups, religious organisations, return services groups and charities that participate in processions and assemblies throughout New South Wales. Not all of them wish to go through the process of getting approval as an authorised public assembly under the Summary Offences Act, which of course will be one of the triggers uh, for the police to be able to use these powers if, there, if an event or pre demonstration is not approved under the Summary Offences Act. Um, there's a whole range of reasons, uh, but the Bar Association uh, concludes, and I quote, there must be a real doubt about the constitutional validity of proposed Section 200 in its application to individuals or groups that are exercising their implied constitutional fr freedom of communication about government and political matters. It may be that a court would consider the law not appropriate and adapted to the achievement of the reasonable regulation of the participants in a public assembly of the requisite type on the basis that it permits a police officer to disperse the assembly or otherwise give directions to participants, or indeed to anyone who happens to be in the vicinity, uh, merely because the assembly, quote, but not, uh, brackets, but not reasonably, but not necessarily the relevant individual given the direction of bracket is obstructing uh, traffic. The proposed section 200 would involve an unjustifiably broad conferral of discretionary power on police officers to prevent or disrupt peaceful assembly, processions and demonstrations. It should not be supported and Section 200 of the LEPRA should be retained in its present form, quote, unquote. Um, in relation to, uh, uh, to the legal situation, uh, the New South Wales Law Society noted that the common law right to assembly has been expressly recognised by Australian courts, including the High Court of Australia and the Supreme Court of New South Wales and the Constitution has been interpreted by the High Court as requiring Australian citizens to be able to assemble before the Federal Parliament, for example, in R versus Smithers, a case in 1912. Um, additionally, the High Court has interpreted the Constitution as providing the implied freedom of political communication, um, which I mentioned earlier, but while this implied freedom is not a personal right, as was found in the case of uh, 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 the former Mayor of uh, Newcastle, um, it would invalidate laws that burden that right if such a law is not appropriately adapted to serve a legitimate end, the fulfilment of which is compatible with the maintenance of the constitutionally prescribed system of representative and responsible government, um, quote unquote. And there I'm quoting from Longy versus the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, a High Court decision in 1997. Courts have noted that peaceful assemblies are, quote, perfectly reasonable and entirely acceptable modes of behaviour in a democracy, unquote, uh, which is from the New South Wales Commission of Police in Bainbridge. Um, and peaceful assemblies are, quote, integral to a democratic system of government and way of life, quote, unquote, uh, which is uh, extracted from the Commission of Police versus Rintoul, a 2003 decision of the New South Wales Supreme Court. And I note also the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights protects the right to peaceful assembly in Article 21, and any limitation of that right must be necessary in a democratic society. So uh, justifying these extraordinary provisions by reference uh, to that requirement, I think, would be a very difficult case to make in support of this legislation. Uh, this legislation, pure and simple, is to simply crack down on the right to peacefully protest it criminalises uh, pro peaceful protest behaviour, which at present is perfectly lawful uh, in the way that I've described. It would criminalise the actions of farmers and other members of the community who, who simply seek to stand up and to be heard and to protest against government. But as I indicated, uh, leaving aside the issue of uh, the power to search, stop the vehicles of people and, and to search them without warrant, the forfeiture of people's property without any due process should disturb every member of this chamber. Mm -hmm. I just ask you to reflect on proposed section 45, capital C on page 5 of the bill. A thing seized under this division is forfeited to the Crown. The local area commander or such other person as the commander may direct may destroy or otherwise dispose of a thing so forfeited. The proceeds of any sale are to be paid to the Treasurer for payment into the Consolidated Fund. And Part 17 does not apply to a thing seized under this division, and a court does not have jurisdiction to order the delivery of the thing to the person from whom the thing was lawfully seized 
or who appears to be lawfully entitled to the thing. So whether it's ropes, devices for locking on, or farm equipment or vehicles, or leaving aside chains, the seizure of vehicles or farm machinery worth tens of thousands of dollars, in the case of tractors worth more, particularly if new, often subject to finance, this bill would enable those valuable pieces of property to be confiscated on the basis of a police officer's reasonable suspicion. And once confiscated... Well, no, Reverend. Read 45 capital C of the bill. If the police officer stops and searches and then decides to seize the thing so that it can't be used, automatically under this bill, those things seized become forfeited to the Crown. And they are not able legally to be returned to the owner. They can be destroyed, they can be sold. Whoever owned that thing loses all right to it, even if that item is a heavily financed piece of farm equipment, which of course could ruin those persons who lose that property. So the fact is, these are extraordinary. These are extraordinary provisions. They are extraordinary provisions which should not be entertained in a modern democratic society. They're not needed because there are already multiple provisions that deal legitimately with trespass and obstruction and criminal damage. But that's not what this bill is about. It's about trying to frighten and intimidate those communities that stood up against coal seam gas across New South Wales and by making an example of those people because they derailed and wrecked this government's gas plan and called the government out for the frauds they are, the government says, well, we're not going to have that in future and we don't like what's going on with our amalgamation, council amalgamations policy unravelling from one end of the state to the other. We don't want any more of our policies to hit the buffers through community action, so we're going to put the frighteners on the public and the citizens of New South Wales and to say that you cannot do this, to send a clear signal that dissent will not be tolerated in New South Wales. That's a very bad message from a party that calls itself the Liberal Party. Just the name of the shop, clearly, because uh, it would be a very strange definition of the term uh, liberal uh, that would authorise or support such extraordinary measures, including the confiscation of private property without any process at all. So I would urge honourable members to resolutely reject uh, 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 the contents of this bill. Uh, at the very least, uh, if you don't want to take my word for its pernicious effects, let's refer it off to a committee so we can have a, a closer look at it, perhaps. Um, we can have a close and quick look at it to see whether or not it does what the government says it does or what we say it does. Um, so with, a good, with a bit of goodwill, we could turn that around very, very quickly. I think it's a very reasonable proposition. What's their hurry? Well, of course, they don't like dissent. They don't like to be called out and they don't like to have their ridiculous ideas held up to the scrutiny of daylight. But we would say to honourable members, think very carefully before you cast your vote in this place in support of these unnecessary but extraordinary and undemocratic measures. They should be rejected, consigned to the dustbin. They should not be enacted in law by this parliament. Thank you.